Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking turkey. You totally stole that <laughs> title from the blog post. It kind of was obvious. Well, yes. Because <laughs> now we're actually talking turkey. turkey. See? We're going to be talking about last year's Thanksgiving video, and we'll be playing that audio in a little bit, and about related issues about food, and globalization, and spice trade. Before we get to that, though, a little bit of follow-up from not the previous episode, because I'll tell you a little secret, I haven't actually posted episode 22 yet. I haven't yet posted episode 23, because I haven't quite finished editing it, so... I can't respond to any feedback from that episode about Dirk Gently because you haven't heard it yet. Welcome from the distant past. <laughs> However, there was a little bit of feedback from episode 22, which was Jack O' Lantern. And one of our listeners, Remy, asked if we'd heard of the custom of saying Halloween apples instead of trick or treat in apparently Saskatchewan or Manitoba. And this is indeed mentioned in the Wikipedia entry on trick or treating. But I had never heard of it. Neither had I. Yeah, so just to say it apparently is a Canadian thing, but it's not one I... It must be very regional. Yeah, not in Ontario as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And I checked. My main source for that video was a book by Nicholas Rogers on Halloween, and mm -hmm. he's uh, a researcher... I think originally born in England, but moved to Canada. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of Canadian content in his detailed, very detailed, well-researched study about Halloween traditions. And so there's a lot of good Canadian stuff in there, but it doesn't mention this. Right. So the few things you saw, you also found some other like Ask Yahoo question or something yeah, about I it. Yeah, I did a bit of a online it, search. It also looks like it's a bit old as pe people from the 60s remembering it. People who were children in the 60s yeah. remembering it. So it may not be current. That might be part of it. But if anyone who's listening does know of the tradition of saying Halloween apples instead of trick-or-treat, I'd be really interested in hearing about that. Yeah, please uh, send us a note or, or whatever. and uh, Yeah, get we'll... in touch. That would be something I'd be interested in. No, and thank you, Remy, for bringing that up because it wasn't something I knew about. Yeah, fascinating. Next, I wanted to plug another podcast. One that has just started quite recently and I think would be of interest to anyone who's listening to this episode. It's called The Story Behind Podcast. And it is a twice-weekly show putting out little, short, 15-minute episodes with the story behind some everyday thing. Recent episodes have covered peanut butter and the theremin and secret ballots and the Electoral College. That one might be a little topical. But they're fun and interesting and definitely worth checking out. So that's the Story Behind podcast on Twitter. It's Story Behind Pod. And when you're looking at that, you might also look at the larger network of podcasts that it's part of, which is the Pottern Family. If you check out the Pottern Family hashtag on Twitter, you'll find a whole bunch of different podcasts on a wide range of topics. They're all independent podcasts, though. They're not the big ones. And it's definitely a great way of finding new podcasts. We also have our own little family of podcasts that we've been uh, working to grow, <laughs> marshalling under a hashtag. Yeah. So if you look at hashtag humanities podcasts and also hashtag humcom vids for videos, you can also start finding uh, new episodes of podcasts that are a little more focused on history, language, art, philosophy, music, archaeology, linguistics, those sorts of subjects. So if you're looking for new podcasts or videos on those sorts of humanities topics, check out those hashtags. Another plug I wanted to make, which is particularly appropriate for the approach that we take here, and I suppose quite relevant to our last episode, mm. which was on Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, all about the interconnectedness of all things, is a new initiative looking at the interconnectedness of all things, by James Burke. Your who, hero. <laughs> my hero, who I've mentioned numerous times on the podcast. So he's got a foundation called the James Burke Foundation, I believe. And their main project is to put together a kind of a, a version of the sort of connections idea 
in a kind of educational application that is free to use in classrooms and for anyone who's interested. Mm -hmm. And so they have a Kickstarter started to launch an app version of this mm -hmm. uh, that you can have on your mobile device of whatever flavor. <laughs> so if you are interested in this sort of a project, you might want to consider pledging your support towards this Kickstarter for this app. It will, of course, benefit students worldwide. Classrooms everywhere will be able to use this project. And us. And us, yes. <laughs> so, so, you know, yes. help support us yeah. by supporting James yeah. Burke. <laughs> so I'm a backer, obviously. But, you know, I think this would be of interest to many people. Yeah. Certainly, if you're interested in this podcast and our videos, it's the sort of thing that might interest you. Where can people find that? So if you go to knowledgediscoveries.com, you will find all the relevant information and a link to the Kickstarter page where you can support this project. Okay, good. Another quick mention for something that we're not going to talk about, so I suppose this is like good Roman poetry recusatio or praetoritio. We will pass by it. <laughs> discussing it only in refusing to discuss it. Right now, the Arrival movie has just come out. I think it's, it may have just premiered this weekend. Mm. And this is the movie that has the aliens coming and a, a linguist as a main character who has to try to figure out how to communicate with the aliens. By the time you hear this, this is probably going to be old news. But we just wanted to mention that we are aware of it. <laughs> But I'm quite interested in it. Mm -hmm. But we haven't seen it this weekend. We're not going to manage to see it anytime soon. There's a lot of discussion going on in various linguistic circles, though. So if you are interested in it, I know the Ling Space has done some videos on it. I think Ben Zimmer has something about it. Yeah. I just listened to Quirks and Quarks, which had an interview with Dan Everett talking about the possibilities of communicating with aliens. So there's a lot of resources out there for talking to linguists about the movie. We may revisit it if we manage to see it someday, but it might be, you know, when it's out on DVD yeah. in eight months. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully sooner than that, but we'll see. So just to mention that we are aware of it. And I Very interested in it. and We'll come back to it. <laughs> we'll come back to it. <laughs> and one last plug is if you're thinking about Christmas cards, you might want to check out our Cafe Press store, cafepress.ca slash endless not for an etymologically themed Christmas card, which we've just put up. It's taken from our last year's Christmas video, and it's about the first day of Christmas and the etymological gift that my true love gave to me. So check that out if you're looking for interesting Christmas cards and if you think your friends would like a laugh on Christmas Day. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that right now. All right, now, before we turn to the main topic of conversation, those turkeys, cocktails. Indeed. Today we are drinking Bushwick's Spice Trade, and this is because the spice trade is going to feature in our discussion. Okay, let's have a drink. The only thing is we had to sub a little bit, or just ignore one ingredient. It's supposed to have fresh basil in it, but our fresh basil is dead because it's been below zero too many nights, and I didn't buy any, so it doesn't have fresh basil in it. However, it does have fresh ginger, pink peppercorns, lemon juice, and gin. What do you think? There's a lot of spiciness going on there. <laughs> Mm. Oh, it's nice. The ginger comes through the most, I think, and the lemon. But well, the... I'm getting the pepper. I'm yeah. definitely getting the pepper. Pink peppercorns are really quite a nice flavor. They're very mm -hmm. different than, than black, black pepper. pepper. Yeah. And they look very pretty in the drink mm -hmm. because they come through. And the picture's up on the website. So, yeah, that's that's quite tasty. A good excuse to make a drink I hadn't had before. Yeah. <laughs> the recipe will be linked to from the website as well. All right. Now, turning to the turkeys. Well, somewhat mischievously, I suppose. I don't know if that's the right, quite the right word. But last year, I posted our Thanksgiving episode for Canadian Thanksgiving. <laughs> I think that's just appropriate because mm. we are, after all, Canadian. And there was a point to it because I go into what is the first Thanksgiving. And Canada has a, a, a case for it, anyways. <laughs> if not a, you know, clinching argument. So... This year, I thought uh, we we would do the Thanksgiving podcast episode timed more for American Thanksgiving. Right. Fair enough. <laughs> so, as is often the case, I did way too much research for this uh, topic and came up with so much material that it simply couldn't fit into the video. 
So I've got loads of stuff, some of which I wrote about in the associated blog post last year, and so I will talk about some of those points that I didn't include in the video today. But first, we're going to listen to Turkey, the video's audio. I've got to find a better way to say that. Just the voiceover? The voiceover? The, yeah. Anyway, we're going to listen to Turkey. Write in and let us know <laughs> what you think we should call the audio, audio from, from the, the video. video. <laughs> so we're going to listen to Turkey, and then we'll come back, and Mark can share the many other facts that he didn't get to put in, and we can talk about a few other things. So, the story of the turkey's name starts with Portuguese trading and confusion with a similar bird, the guinea fowl. The guinea fowl comes originally from Africa, where it has long been an important food. The Romans spread it from North Africa across their empire, but when that fell, the bird disappeared from Europe. However, the guinea fowl was reintroduced into Europe by the Turks in the 15th century when it became known as the turkey cock or turkey hen, in other words, the poultry from Turkey, in the belief that that's where the birds came from. The origin of the word Turk itself is uncertain, though it might have been recorded as early as 177 BCE in Chinese as Tukin, referring to a people living south of the Altaian Mountains. In Persian, Turk is said to mean a beautiful youth, a barbarian, or a robber. However, it might in fact come from an old Turkic root which means created, strong, or lineage. Oh, and turquoise also comes from the country's name for similar reasons of trade, and was sometimes called turkey stone, or simply turkey. Speaking of trade, it was the spice trade from India that was the real prize commodity at that period. The Ottoman Empire and the Venetians had the direct route locked up between them, and were thus making a mint from selling the eastern spices to all of Europe. But the Portuguese decided on an altogether more adventurous plan to reach India entirely by sea, by sailing around Africa, and after Vasco da Gama's explorations at the end of the 15th century, they started shipping spices back from Calcutta, India, to Europe. They traced their way along the coast, and would of course stop at various points picking up other commodities that were available, including the guinea fowl from West Africa. So they brought them back to Europe as well, along with their haul from India. Well, the Portuguese realized what a gold mine they were sitting on. Almost literally, in addition to spices from India, they picked up gold, ivory, and slaves from West Africa. So they did what any emerging capitalist venture would do, keep the details of their trade routes and sources a corporate secret. So no one back in Europe knew exactly where anything the Portuguese were importing came from, including the guinea fowl. While some still called them turkey cocks, they also started picking up names like, in French, pool d'Inde, hen from India, or simply d'Inde, or in Dutch, kalkoen, referring to Calcutta. So how did names like turkey and d'Inde come to refer not to what we know as guinea fowl, but to the bird native to the Americas? At about the same time the Portuguese traders were importing all these goods from their trade route to India, the early 16th century, they also picked up real turkeys in mid-Atlantic island trade from Spanish merchants, who had brought them back from the New World, after Columbus, in an attempt to reach the Indian spices by sailing across the Atlantic, bumped into the Americas. Not that he knew it at first. The Spanish conquistadors had been the first Europeans to encounter the New World turkeys, which had long been domesticated by the Aztecs, who called the male Huexolotl and the female Totolin. Turkeys were an important animal to the Aztecs, as well as the Maya and other Mesoamerican groups, to the point that they were associated with the Aztec trickster god, Tetzcatlipoca, who could appear as Chalchutotolin, the jeweled turkey, and whose priest would be decorated with turkey feathers. The Spanish had already been bringing back turkeys for a little while, along with all the gold they plundered from the Aztecs, but it was the Portuguese importing two similar types of bird, guinea fowl and New World turkeys, and keeping the sources of both of them vague or secret that led to Europeans confusing the two and calling them all by the same name, turkey cock or hen from India or whatever, and the original Spanish heir in thinking of the New World as India didn't help to clarify anything. To be fair, the two birds did look fairly similar, particularly the helmeted guinea fowl with its distinctive head and spotted feathers. So in the end, the name turkey stuck for the New World turkey, but the guinea fowl came to be distinguished by the name it has today, when its association with the area of Africa known as Guinea became clear. That part of the coast of West Africa came to be called Guinea by the Portuguese, who as we've seen were the European experts on West Africa. They probably got it from a North African language, maybe the Berber word agana, meaning black, in reference to the dark colour of the skin of the inhabitants further south in Africa. Later on, when the European traders reached the South Pacific, they used the name New Guinea to refer to one of the large islands they found there due to perceived similarities in the populations. In the 17th century, the English started making a gold coin that came to be known as the Guinea, initially for the use of the company of royal adventurers trading to Africa who profited from the slave trade in the region and made from gold they also imported. And by the way, the story of the guinea pig is similar to that of the turkey. 
Guinea pigs, which are neither pigs nor come from Guinea, actually come from South America where they were and still are an important food source in many regions, particularly around the Andes Mountains where they were domesticated some 7,000 years ago. Like the turkey, the guinea pig was also important for ritual purposes. For instance, among the Inca, guinea pigs were sacrificed to the gods and eaten as part of ceremonial or festive meals, not unlike turkeys at Thanksgiving dinner. Guinea pigs have also been used in traditional healing or divination rituals, and even turn up in depictions of the Last Supper. The Spanish imported the animals into Europe, Queen Elizabeth had one as a pet, where they came to be known as the guinea pig, likely because they were part of the same West African mid-Atlantic trade route that led to the turkey guinea fowl confusion. So it's perhaps not surprising that their name in French is cochon d'Inde, or pig from India. But the confusion between the birds even seems to have tripped up the scientists. When Carl Linnaeus, the great taxonomist, categorized them, he used the Roman word for guinea fowl, Meliagris, ultimately from Greek, as the genus of the turkey and the species of the helmeted guinea fowl. There's an origin story associated with the word Meliagris. In the usual backward fashion of myth, it claims that the bird was named after the hero Meliager. When Meliager was a baby, his mother Althea was told by the fates that he would live only so long as a log that was on the fire lasted. His mother, of course, put out the burning log and locked it away for safekeeping. Years later, his father Oeneus, who according to myth had given wine to the Greeks, so you might want to raise a toast to him at your Thanksgiving dinner, forgot to honor the goddess Artemis with the first fruits of his harvest at the annual harvest festival. Artemis was miffed and sent the monstrous Caledonian boar to terrorize the kingdom. Oeneus and Meliager organized a great hunt, and after the boar was killed, a fight broke out over the spoils, and Meliager killed his uncles. His mother, furious at the death of her brothers, throws the fateful log onto the fire, and Meliager dies. His sisters, wearing black outfits of mourning, are, in their grief, transformed into birds, their tears becoming the spots on the bird's feathers, and that's the bird we now know as the guinea fowl. Actually, the word Meliagris may possibly be a word from Persian, from a word meaning bird or fowl, or, more likely, it's just Greek meaning black silver, describing the bird's appearance, black with white spots. But it's quite appropriate that the beginning of the whole Caledonian boar story is Oeneus' failure to honor Artemis in a harvest festival, since it of course connects to the turkey's starring role in the modern Thanksgiving feast. But getting back to the New World turkey, though the turkey is often associated with the early Thanksgivings in North America, today's domesticated turkey descends from the Aztec domesticated fowl that was brought back to Europe and selectively bred there and was then introduced into North America by the English colonists who saw the wild turkeys in the New Land as being similar to our English turkeys, effectively appropriating the turkey as a European animal. Both guinea fowl and New World turkey spread through Europe in the 16th century, and by the end of that century the turkey had become the standard of feasts like Christmas dinner. William Shakespeare even mentions the turkey a number of times, including figuratively of a proud or arrogant person. And speaking of Shakespeare, his play The Tempest seems to have been inspired by the shipwreck of the Sea Venture on its way to the newly founded Jamestown colony, one of the sites, as we will see, that claims the first Thanksgiving in the New World. So why is the turkey connected so strongly to Thanksgiving? Well, the commonly told story is of the feast held by the pilgrims at the Plymouth Colony after surviving their first year in 1621 to express their gratitude to God and to the local native inhabitants who had helped the colonists survive the harsh winter and who brought the turkeys to the feast. But there are a number of historical problems with the story. While the Native Americans certainly did help the settlers make it through the first winter, the colonists do not seem to have intended the feast as a reciprocal gesture of gratitude, but as, in part, a show of strength to allies they did not fully trust. And the relationship between the two groups was complicated from the very beginning, and even if the Wampanoag people did bring wild turkeys to the feast, the settlers would already have been familiar with the domesticated turkey, or maybe even had some of their own, and in any case, they weren't a very big part of the dinner. Also, the pilgrims weren't really pilgrims. They never used that name for themselves, though I suppose it would have been appropriate. The word pilgrim comes from Latin pair, meaning through, and agar, meaning field or countryside. The idea being literally wandering through the countryside, and that agar root also gives us agriculture, appropriate for a harvest festival. They were followers of Calvinism though, and they were against holidays and merrymaking, and like many Protestant groups, they instead had an austere religious tradition of days of thanksgiving, which often ironically involved fasting, not feasting, and which could be helped for a variety of reasons, whenever they felt the need to express gratitude to God. And the feast at the Plymouth Colony was one of these, and did mark the successful harvest as well as their first year. But that first feast did not begin a yearly tradition, it was a one-off event, nor was it even the first day of Thanksgiving held in North America. 
Jamestown, Virginia, the first English colony in the Americas, which is connected with Shakespeare's play The Tempest, you remember, has a recorded day of Thanksgiving in 1619, two years earlier than the Plymouth event. It celebrated surviving a very harsh winter and not starving to death, and was triggered by the arrival of another ship of settlers with fresh supplies so that they had food again. But there's an even earlier Thanksgiving celebration in North America than Jamestown, in what later became Canada, which is appropriate since nowadays Canadian Thanksgiving is celebrated more than a month earlier than the American holiday. In 1578, the English sailor Martin Frobisher and his crew, attempting to find a northwest passage to reach India and China and all those valuable trade commodities, was driven back by storms and landed on Baffin Island and declared a day of thanksgiving for their safe landing. So not a harvest festival, but still giving thanks for surviving hardship. Frobisher, who had started out his maritime career with a trip to Guinea, remember that place, was not a careful and accomplished explorer, and gave up on his search for a northwest passage when he thought he found a source of gold which turned out to be worthless pyrite. And there's one last contender for the first Thanksgiving. Way back in 1565, the Spanish Admiral Pedro Mendez de Aviles, after catching sight of land at Florida on the feast day of St. Augustine of Hippo, who happened to be the patron saint of his hometown, founded and named the new colony San Agustin and immediately declared a day of Thanksgiving to celebrate their safe arrival, which was attended by some of the native inhabitants. St. Augustine, by the way, is held up by the Calvinists as having laid the groundwork for the Protestant Reformation, so I guess that brings us back to those so-called pilgrims. Now none of those first Thanksgivings established a tradition, or tied it to the turkey, but throughout the colonial period there were various days of Thanksgiving, as there were in the Canadian colonies. The first official National Canadian Day of Thanksgiving was declared in 1879 in honour of the Prince of Wales recovering from an illness, and there were various local harvest celebrations, but no national holiday. However, a tradition of a general harvest festival did develop independently in New England, held in November with a mainly religious focus. And that celebration tended to include turkey, because that bird had long been a feature of festive meals in England, replacing the goose and the guinea fowl as I mentioned earlier. And so, when Thanksgiving eventually became a national holiday in the US, elements of that New England tradition became widespread, like the turkey and the cranberry sauce. But not everyone is happy that there's a national holiday that celebrates the settlement of North America by Europeans. Since 1970, there has been a national day of mourning held at Plymouth Rock on the same date as Thanksgiving to commemorate the genocide of native people and the theft of native lands. So I should point out that although the turkey in the Thanksgiving feast has been turned into a symbol of the peaceful and friendly relations between settlers and Native Americans, actually it served because of the English tradition of eating turkey at celebratory feasts as a result of its appropriation by earlier European settlers from Mesoamerican people they'd conquered not because of it being among the foods contributed by Native Americans at Plymouth. But turkey is the one thing that Canadian Thanksgiving, which actually comes more directly from British harvest festivals, owes to the US. The United Empire Loyalists, who left the US for British-held Canada at American independence, brought the Thanksgiving turkey to Canada, because by that point the Americans were really into turkeys. Benjamin Franklin even argued for the wild turkey to be the national bird of the United States rather than the eagle, if you can picture that. So, from first fruits at a harvest festival, to early trade routes to India and secret origins, to the search for other routes to the Orient, and the first feasts of Thanksgiving, to the appropriation of food and land from the First Nations, the story of the turkey's name is in many ways the story of the spice trade, and exploring it teaches us about Thanksgiving and its own origins in the many confusions, conquests, cultural clashes, and changes of that period. If you're sitting down to a Thanksgiving turkey anytime soon, try spicing up the dinner conversation with a peppering of etymology, and consider the unexpected twists and turns that brought you and it here. So first of all, I want to do a call out to one of my main sources for this script. It's a book by linguist Dan Jurafsky called The Language of Food. A linguist reads the menu, and he also has a blog which has a you know, an earlier version of his chapter on Turkey. Right. Um, so we'll, I'll put a link to that blog. So harvest festivals, which leads me to the word harvest itself, uh, which comes from a Proto-Indo-European root terp, which means to gather or pluck, to harvest, right. literally. Right. And also gives us the Latin word carpera. Right. And also eventually gives us the word scarce from Latin carpera, which develops from the sense of plucked out. So plucked out, therefore scarce. Okay. And so in the sense rare. Mm -hmm. 
which reminds us, of course, of the scarcity of food in all of those early North American settlements. <laughs> right. And all European those days of Thanksgiving celebrating the we didn't starve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But of course, that Latin word is probably most famous to all of us from the phrase carpe diem, seize the day. Mm hmm. Which we actually talked about in another podcast episode way, way back. I think it was episode five. And at the time, <laughs> I was researching this very video, right. which is why it we came up. We talked about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so carpe diem is very well known as a phrase from a Horace poem. Yeah. So I thought I would continue my occasional series of Avon Reed's Latin poems to people mm -hmm. and just read you that quite short Horace poem that is so famous as the carpe diem poem. I don't have my preferred translation here with me. This one is the poetryintranslation.com A.S. Klein version. It's fine, but there's another one in the Oxford World Classics that I like better. I think it's slightly more poetic. But anyway, so it's a short poem about the importance of paying attention to the present and not worrying about the future. I'll just read it for you. Luconoe, don't ask. We never know what fate the gods grant us. Whether your fate or mine, don't waste your time on Babylonian futile calculations. How much better to suffer what happens, whether Jupiter gives us more winters, or this is the last one, one debilitating the Tyrrhenian sea on opposing cliffs. Be wise, and mix the wine, since time is short. Limit that far-reaching hope. The envious moment is flying now, now while we're speaking. Seize the day. Place in the hours that come as little faith as you can. And just for the point, seize the day there is carpe diem, and it really is pluck the day. Pluck it the is day. an agricultural metaphor. Take it while it's ripe before it disappears. Right. So it's about ripeness and the proper moment. If you do not pluck the day while it is ripe, it will wither on the vine. Right. That's the metaphor that's there. So that's why it, it was translated. It mm -hmm. That's why it was translated later as the gather ye rosebuds while ye may right. sentiment. It's mm -hmm. the same agricultural metaphor. Well, that Proto-Indo-European root, kerp, goes back even further to a root, care or scare, which means to cut or shear, and eventually gives us many English words, including to share, from the idea of a division or portion, a share of something, right? Right. So sharing is a way of getting around scarcity, <laughs> etymologically connected. Sharing um, those things you plucked. Carp yes. Carpeed. You've carpeed, <laughs> yeah. From the ground, yeah. And so again, that reminds us of those early European settlements and the help that they received mm -hmm. from the Native Americans. By the way, that root also leads to the Latin word caro carnis, as in carnivore. Meat. Meat, which brings us back to the turkey. So you can think about that as you sink your teeth into the juicy <laughs> turkey leg. <laughs> Which was not served in the Renaissance feasts, no matter what people <laughs> say. <laughs> Though so, I suppose if Shakespeare was mentioning Turkey in his plays, we can't completely rule it out of those no, Renaissance fairs. that's true. <laughs> yeah, it is entirely possible. So, uh, sticking to the harvest theme, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, there are, of course, many different harvest festivals. One, I suppose, we could mention is Lammas because it connects nicely to our previous video and podcast, because it, it comes from the Old English word loaf. Oh, right, right. Loaf mass. I thought you were going to point back to the Halloween ones, because <laughs> Lammas and Lammas Eve are also witches' festivals. Right, festivals. that's true as well, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's the idea of the grain, the wheat harvest. Right. So Lammas is August 1st. Okay. But perhaps more relevant to Thanksgiving is Martinmas, or St. Right. Martin's Day, right? which is, as we record, only just past. Mm -hmm. uh, it's November 11th. Remembrance Day. Remembrance Day. So only a few weeks before American Thanksgiving. And that was the feast where goose was served. Where goose was served, because there is a wonderful story about St. Martin, St. Martin of Tours, who, upon hearing that he was going to be made a bishop and not wanting the job... <laughs> I don't think I'd want to be bishop. Well, no. <laughs> and I suppose if you're truly pious, any elevation in status goes against your commitment to poverty and right. hum humility. Abasing yourself before yeah. the Lord and all that stuff, yeah. 
So he tried to hide from those wishing to thrust this particular duty upon him, and he hid in a goose pen (laughs) until the cackling of the geese, no doubt inspired by the Holy Spirit, uh, (laughs) revealed his location, and he was stuck with it. Of course, geese are known as good Cacklers. Cacklers as, <laughs> as good alarms. Guard, guard animals. Guard animals, yeah. yeah. And sort of there's the famous story of the Romans being warned warned of the uh, nighttime attack of the Gauls by the geese. Uh, this story told in Livy. That as the Gauls were attacking Rome, this is in 4th century, I think, BC. Mm. And the geese warned that they were climbing the citadel. And they were the geese, the sacred geese of Juno. And the temple was therefore renamed to Juno Moneta, Juno who warns. Right. That is relevant because Juno Moneta, that temple, became later on the repository for and the the storehouse for the money, the treasury. the word money. Hence the word money and hence the word mint. Mint as well, Mm yeah. Both of which come from the root of Moneta. Or at least maybe do. That was certainly what the Romans thought the Juno Moneta was. But I recently was reading an article that said they're not I, sure I, that it's uh, actually from that root, but all but. the etymological sources I've read on this accept that mm-hmm. it was story, certainly the so. the Roman explanation for the the epithet of Juno for sure, and certainly money and mint certainly come from her name. That's mm. not in question. It's just about where moneta comes from and whether it really means warning. Well, speaking of poultry warning systems, <laughs> as one does, <laughs> as one does, apparently guinea fowl. Getting back to them. Mm-hmm. Um, are also valued as barnyard warning systems. Um, mm-hmm. And so they're often kept amongst the barnyard poultry more for their, their value as a, you know protecting her, the, the, uh, right. the flock as they are for their meat or, meat or, or eggs. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. So that is another purpose for them in, in our agricultural processes. I suppose fowl as warning systems or sirens isn't surprising given the roosters also not known for warnings, but roosters are, of course, our alarm clocks. Yes. So, yeah. you know, the idea that fowl, that barnyard fowl of various sorts are noisy with a purpose. No, yeah. So getting back to Thanksgiving itself, then, during the American Civil War, Abraham Lincoln was the first president to make Thanksgiving an annual holiday. This was in 1863 and based this on off the um, New England Uh, traditional harvest thanksgiving festival and fixing it on the last thursday in november this changed slightly later the the way that it was calculated calculated. basically with the express goal of fostering national unity this of course comes during the civil war right so this was a way of trying to create a sort of sense of national pride and unity and so forth um he was sort of convinced on this point by one Sarah Josepha Hale, uh, who is an author and also, the Im- importantly, the editor of um, Godey's Ladies Book, the premier ladies' magazine of the, of the age. She's sort of the, the Martha Stewart of the 19th century. Right. And this was one of her big causes, and she'd been writing to various politicians about presidents and governors, presidents yeah. and, governors and so forth, trying to convince them of accepting this holiday as a national thing. She is also known for writing in her sort of fiction, uh, in her novels, stories of romances between Northerners and Southerners, always with a happy ending. So trying to use fiction to heal the North-South divide. Right. And her other major claim to fame, of course, is uh, she wrote the children's poem, Mary Had a Little Lamb. (laughs) I bet when people are thinking about their lives... And they think about, what am I going to be Be remembered remembered for? for, What is the world going to know me for? When you spend your life as an eminent literary figure and campaigning for what you see as strong and important political events, and you also happen to write a little children's poem, you don't think that's the one that's going to (laughs) stick. Now, to be fair, nobody knows her for that because nobody knows who wrote it. But still, that was the one that stuck. That's probably her most famous. Her most well-known, widespread contribution to humanity. Though she is also largely responsible for making Christmas a major holiday in the United States. By importing a lot of those Victorian, Victorian things, things that were going on, right? Yeah, yeah. particularly uh, she published in the Godey's Ladies book a picture of Queen Victoria celebrating Christmas, and this became a sort of model. She held up 
Queen Victoria as the model of ideal Domesticity. woman. Domesticity, yeah. So I suppose, given her major influence on both Thanksgiving and Christmas, Americans have her to thank for the whole holiday season, that whole right, unit from of Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, to, Thanksgiving Christmas, to Christmas. Yeah. yeah. So I suppose because of you know Thanksgiving's New England roots, and in particular Lincoln's kind of Unionist intentions, mm -hmm. uh, trying to uh, you know during the Civil War, it's not surprising that the holiday was not at least initially very popular in the Southern states. Right. So they took a bit longer to embrace its celebration. Though in the end, they did end up contributing the important sweet potatoes with marshmallows on top. <laughs> at least I understand that's important. I don't know. I still haven't ever eaten it, so I don't know. But I hear it's a big deal. <laughs> so when they came on board, they came on board. <laughs> so it is, I guess, fitting that the debate about the first, the so-called first right, Thanksgiving is between... is between the two major candidates uh, are a northern and a southern location. Yeah. So there are, of course, lots of different words for the bird turkey around the world. Yeah, and um, one of the things, this is one of the videos that has, in some ways, the most feedback. We've had people... A lot of people contributing the words for turkey in their language, yeah. and there's a lot of and really a lot of interesting fun ones. ones. Yeah. There's a whole Wikipedia article, right, on there words for turkey. There is a whole page on different words for turkey from around the world. And, you know, we can mention a few here, but by all means, please... Go uh, and check that go out. Go and yeah. check them out, and or send in your favorites. <laughs> you know, we're always happy and entertained by hearing these. Because there is such variety, and some of them are quite fascinating. And they're almost all geographical. Yeah, it's well, a, a number of them. A, a, a large a number of them, number of them are, are geographical, geographical. And it is yeah. really interesting that it is, for some reason, such a focus of recognition that this is an imported food. Yeah. You know, it, wherever somewhere. it's from, <laughs> it's from hits. somewhere else in every place. But yeah, it's always, and almost always seems to be really heavily labeled as mm -hmm. imported. So in English, we... Call it Turkish. Uh, we refer to Turkey as the location. The Turkish word is Hindi, <laughs> pointing to India. The Hindi word, as well as the Portuguese word, points to Peru. So it's called Peruvian, mm -hmm. basically. Which is getting closer. <laughs> <laughs> Which is at least the right hemisphere. Yeah, right continent. The right, right continent. Yeah. So, I mean, it goes all over the place. But I think some of my favorites, the Japanese means seven-faced bird. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I don't know what it means, but it's pretty cool. My friend over at the Ling Space uh, mentioned that it's because of the colorful face and feathers. And uh, oh, since so seven, seven is the number used to denote numerous in Japanese. So it's like it has lots of colors. On lots it. of colors, yes. So thank you, Modi. Another favorite of mine is the Tamil word, which is sky chicken. <laughs> Which is odd because the bird doesn't fly. Well, they do. Well, wild turkeys do. Yeah, okay. Wild turkeys, wild fly. turkeys fly. It's. I mean, they're not great flyers. They're not graceful <laughs> soars over the countryside, but they t they're perfectly capable flyers. But the domesticated one, it's been bred mm -hmm. out of them, much like right, chickens. Yeah. But maybe the ones that first came to made it to southern India could still fly. <laughs> And this, of course, leads me to, you know, the sort of modern kind of euphemisms that Turkey has attached itself to. Mm. You know, you talk about a turkey as a, you know, a, a word for a stupid person or yeah. a foolish person yeah. or something. No doubt due to the reputation that the turkey has as a kind of clumsy or mm -hmm. foolish or, you know, whatever bird. Mm -hmm. Whether that is entirely justified or not. It probably depends on whether you're talking about a domesticated or a domesticated or a wild, or a wild, one, wild yeah. turkey. Cold turkey, right? as in to quit cold turkey, probably develops from the idea of the turkey being served without preparation. Hmm. And Like, wait, like a roast? Cooked, I'm presuming. As leftovers? Raw. Or just, I don't know what that means. Uh, I'm pressing you on something you don't know either, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> like as leftovers? I guess so, yeah. Because that's how turkey is, cold. Cold, cold turkey. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll accept that. <laughs> To talk turkey, this is comes from a supposedly humorous, actually not humorous, but kind of racist story. Mm. Um, Shocking that that would be associated with turkeys. Indeed. Of a swindling colonial and a Native American dividing up the spoils of, a, of hunting together mm. and the colonial talking the turkey for himself. Oh, okay. So convincing. Convincing, convincing the... Uh, Hapless, too. Yeah. And then leaving the less desirable... 
catch you know whatever animals they had for his companion whether or not this story is actually true as to the origin of the phrase mm -hmm. it certainly does reflect something of the nature of the relationship between those american colonists, colonists and the people who and are the, here yeah and the indigenous population and so finally this brings us to the real implication of the whole story and the sort of modern globalized world that we live in mm -hmm. um I guess the real message behind this is that the world that produced this confusion in terms mm -hmm. is largely responsible for our food for system, the food, for the way the food system works. For the way the food system works today, and we're still stuck with it. I mean, ask yourself, you know, when you're sitting down to your turkey dinner or whatever, do you know where the foods on on the table mm. came from? Not only where they immediately came from, but where they originally mm. came from, because they maybe uh, have become domesticated and bred in a location that is, you know, thousands of, of wow. miles from where they originally were produced. Yeah, it's easy to look back and, and laugh about the way the turkey gets misnamed for places it's not from, and the guinea pig mm -hmm. and all the rest in the video. But I don't think we're actually any more educated about those things now. In no. fact, it's harder even to trace a lot of these things. And th the, their origins have become much more muddy. Mm -hmm. And it's much harder to figure out where everything's coming from, both in its real origins and in its immediate origins. And, you know, doing a bit of etymological detective work like this can sometimes reveal those hidden origins, mm -hmm. but often not in a very direct way. No. And even once you know... It can be hard to know what to do with that information. Mm -hmm. It's not like we can all suddenly decide to go live off the land. The idea that we can all suddenly go back to a 100-mile yeah. diet and everybody eat only those things that there are really truly native and indigenous to their area is a pipe dream. It's not, it's not, not with our population. It's not a sustainable thing. Anyone who's able to do that has immense privilege, and that's wonderful if they can, but most of us can't. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's a reality that the world is this global interconnected system for better and for worse, but at least we can try to know a little bit about it. And that's the thing, I think, is, is just trying to be aware of how that system works and where that food comes from and what the history that led to that food, you know, being on your table, mm -hmm. what that history involves. Mm -hmm. And the winners and the losers in that story, mm -hmm. which is often not part of the story once it's on your table. Yeah. And on that happy <laughs> note... <laughs> Well, there was one other story that you suggested that we could talk about that or one other thing you asked me to think mm. about that I could perhaps bring in that is uh, nice and apolitical. <laughs> so perhaps let's turn to that. And on a high note. And on a slightly less depressing less note <laughs> before we send everyone away to their wonderful Thanksgiving dinners. <laughs> if they're having that. Uh, which was just the quick mention of Meliager, which you tell the story, the basic story of Meliager, um, in connection to why the guinea fowl is known as the Meliager or Meliagrides in Greek, and then that becomes the Latin term for it as well. And I just wanted to add one little thing, because the interesting thing about Meliager is his most famous appearance in classical literature is actually not the story of his death and his sister's transformation, though I think I will add to my Avon Reed's Latin poetry in a moment and read you the bit from Ovid where that story is told. But Melia gradually turns up in our earliest Greek literature. He turns up in the Iliad. And he's in the Iliad in a very weird way that is very emblematic of how Homer uses other myth, myth that isn't the actual Trojan War story. To very briefly summarize, when Achilles has withdrawn from the war because he's angry at Agamemnon, sitting in his tent and sulking, and he doesn't want to fight. And Agamemnon realizes that the Greeks have been slaughtered by the Trojans because Achilles isn't fighting anymore. So he decides to relent, and he sends an embassy of Odysseus, Ajax, and Phoenix, who is a Achilles' oldest friend among the Greeks, to go and tell them that Agamemnon will give him lots and lots and lots of prizes if he'll come back and accept Agamemnon's apology and fight. And so they go off, and each of the three of them tries to convince Achilles to go back to fighting. And Phoenix, to do so, tells the story of Meleager. But as Homer often does, and it's very interesting, he tells not the story of the Caledonian boar in its details, not the story of the firebrand 
which is what you told the story of, but an episode that we know almost no other references to. Phoenix says that after they killed the Caledonian boar, there was a battle between the people that Meliager killed, their town, and Meliager's town. And there was this big battle that was going on. And Meliager didn't want to fight. He just wanted to hang out with his new wife and sit in there. He was just mad at everybody and at his mother because she'd cursed him or something and refused to fight. And Phoenix says that they came and offered him lots and lots and lots of gifts to fight. And he refused and he refused. And then suddenly when he realized his city was about to fall, he went out and fought anyway. And then they didn't give him his gifts. So this is an interesting parallel. Yeah. It's been manipulated by Phoenix to make it into a parallel. And Phoenix says, so don't be like Meliager. Don't wait till the last minute and fight anyway and not get the gifts. Accept the gifts now and then fight. You know you'll do it in the end anyway. You might as well get all of your gifts and get all the honors you're going to get. And this seems to be one of these interesting uses of myth where he doesn't then go on and say, oh, and by the way, Meliager was killed by his mother because she was mad at him <laughs> or, you know, any of the other stories. He uses only this tiny little bit out of it and turns it into an exemplum. And it's a really good example of how the ancient world used myth, which was not just as like fun stories around the campfire or something, but as ways of instructing people. But you could change it, or you could highlight it, or you could point only to the thing that was important for the story you were trying to tell, for the persuasion you were trying to do. And so the Meliager story in the Iliad is a really good example of very carefully curated use of myth, mm -hmm. where it doesn't match terribly well with any of the other versions of Meliager we have from the ancient world. But that's because Phoenix is using it in a very specific mm -hmm. way. He fails, however, to persuade Achilles. All three of them fail. Achilles refuses to accept the gifts and refuses to fight. And so it, one could see perhaps that he tried to use myth on his side and, and wasn't able to, maybe because he had to distort the myth so much that it didn't work in the end. So anyway, I just think that's kind of interesting because it's a very instructive example of how myth works. Myth within a myth. Right. And I guess that's a little bit like the early proponents of Thanksgiving as an American national holiday, manipulating the, the stories story, yeah. of yeah. Plymouth and so forth to make a political point. Yeah, um, absolutely. But not really reflecting the reality of those early events. Yeah, it, exactly. I mean, myth, it points to the point of myth. It's mythologizing those. Yeah, the point of myth events, is yeah. to create the narrative, is to turn history into a narrative, whether the history really happened or not. But I mean, for the Greeks, they thought that the myths were history. So if they were manipulating the myths, they thought they were manipulating history, if you right. see what I mean. They thought it was as real as anybody in the 8th, 19th century thought pilgrims were real. Uh, yeah, it's about manipulating history to turn it into a narrative that fits the ideology you want mm -hmm. to convey. And that is, that is something that mythology has always been used for. And it's important to recognize that the neater the narrative is and the better it fits your current circumstances, the more you should be looking side-eye at it mm. and wondering why it's so perfectly fitting the point that's right. trying to be made. So I'm not sure this lightened the mood all that much. Okay, okay, let me read. Oh, this isn't going to help either. <laughs> <laughs> let me read the little bit of Ovid that tells of the death of Meliager and the transformation of his sisters, right? That's happy. <laughs> Just because. So this is in Ovid, many, many, many of the stories that we have of the ancient world that we think are Greek stories, we actually only have as our earliest version in Ovid. Ovid's Metamorphosis written right around the turn of the millennium, turn of the everything. <laughs> you know, <laughs> around zero <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. The end of the first century BC and the beginning of the, the first turning century. Turning of the gyres? Uh, yeah. <laughs> turning and turning and a widening gyre. Exactly. <sighs> what rough beast is this that... <laughs> that slouches toward Bethlehem? To be born. Turning and turning and in a widening gyre. The center cannot hold. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> I can't handle it. It's all so depressing. Okay, okay, let me think instead <laughs> of Ovid. Many of these stories come from Ovid as our first literary source of them. And in this case, it's the Metamorphosis of Meliager's sister that gives, sisters, that gives us the guinea fowl. So let me just read the very last bit. So Meliager has been burned 
log has been thrown on the fire by his mother and Meleager has died. And everybody is very sad and lamenting. Once the ashes are gathered and they, his sisters, press them to their breasts, throw themselves down on his tomb, and clasping the stone carved with his name, they drown the name with tears. At last, Diana, remember that is the goddess who was offended in the very beginning, Artemis, by being left out of the Harvest Festival. At last, Diana, satiated with her destruction of the house of Partheon, lifted them up, all except Gorge and Deianira, the daughter-in-law of noble Alcmena, and, making feathers spring from their bodies and stretching long wings over their arms, she gave them beaks and changed to guinea hens. The Meliagrides launched them into the air. Meliagrides, the sisters of Meliagra. So no, that doesn't lighten the mood at all. No. <laughs> well, after all, the days of Thanksgiving or days of mourning. Indeed. So maybe <laughs> highly grim discussion is appropriate. Sorry. And our previous quoting of, of Yeats suddenly reminded me of the other rather significant line in that particular poem. Mm -hmm. uh, the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Oh, oh. yeah. All too appropriate, apt. perhaps. All too apt. Oh, the second coming is just never not depressingly accurate. Mm -hmm. Though I suppose the Antichrist hasn't actually made it up yet. <laughs> I think. Right. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving! <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose if you do celebrate Thanksgiving now, it is perhaps a good time to think about what you are thankful for and mm -hmm. to remember that. And to try to make more people thankful for more things. Mm -hmm. Not to be preachy. One of the things we thought about talking about in this episode, but I think we've had enough to talk about, is the difference between Canadian and American Thanksgivings. And they're very similar in many ways. One of the things about Canadian Thanksgiving is it's less clearly tied to church. Yeah. And it's less clearly tied to a national myth. Yeah. It's not that there aren't elements of that there. And it does come from a British Harvest Church Festival. But at least in my experience, Thanksgiving in Canada has been very non-religious and non-political in general. What that means is it is a time for thinking about what you have, what you're glad to have, and remember what other people don't have and why you have what you have. And that doesn't have to be grim. But it does have to, I think, make you think about the world in a wider way, which is really the whole point of this story of the turkey. Right. So happy Thanksgiving, if you're celebrating it. And whether or not you are, we'll be back <laughs> with hopefully a slightly less depressing topic in a couple of weeks. And probably thinking about Christmas. Because after all, come Thanksgiving, it's time for Christmas. <laughs> For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye. Well, that wasn't grim. <laughs> that was totally fine, and I'm completely happy. And in no way going to weep my way through bedtime now. Oh. Of course, you're in the mood to watch some Dirk Gently. Oh, God. Freezed. What about Rain of Blood? <laughs> oh, right. Well, <laughs> Dirk Gently or Rain of Blood. Oh, God. <laughs>